Right now, at this very moment, something is happening beneath California's East Bay that scientists cannot fully explain. The ground trembles. Again. And again. A relentless pattern has gripped the region for weeks. Not a single devastating rupture followed by aftershocks, but dozens upon dozens of tremors striking without warning, without end. Most events are too modest to crack foundations, yet powerful enough to jolt residents from sleep and send dishes clattering across kitchen counters. This is not the familiar rhythm of a major earthquake followed by its fading echoes. It is something more unsettling, an earthquake swarm that refuses to stop. Why has this fault section awakened now after years of relative quiet? What does it mean when small ruptures cluster without a dominant main shock? And could this pattern be transferring accumulated strain to the San Andreas Fault, loading it for something catastrophic? Since early November, the Calaveras Fault has unleashed over 150 seismic events in a concentrated zone southeast of San Ramon. The largest struck on November 9th at magnitude 3.8, followed weeks later by a magnitude 3.6 on December 8th. But these headline tremors tell only part of the story. Between them, dozens of smaller ruptures rattled through at magnitudes between 2.0 and 3.2, each releasing stored energy in sharp bursts. Most originated at shallow depths between 5 and 10 kilometers below the surface, close enough that the shaking arrives viscerally to those living directly above. No injuries have been reported, no structures have fallen, but the trembling persists, day after day. Data from the United States Geological Survey reveals the cluster spans roughly one mile in radius along the northern segment of the Calaveras Fault. Here, the fault structure fragments into a complex web of fractures. Each tremor releases stress in small increments, but stress is still building elsewhere, on sections that remain locked and silent. This activity did not begin in December. The sequence traces back to October, when the first subtle tremors appeared on seismic monitors. Through November, the pattern intensified, evolving from sporadic pulses into sustained volleys. Early November brought the surge that captured public attention. Between November 9th and 10th alone, more than 40 distinct ruptures struck within a 24-hour window. The magnitude 3.8 event became the sequence's most powerful tremor to date, strong enough to startle churchgoers mid-service in Danville. Then the swarm quieted for a week, like a held breath. Residents dared to hope it had ended. On November 18th, that hope collapsed. The tremors resumed with renewed vigor. By early December, another concentrated burst arrived, heralded by a magnitude 3.6 rupture on December 8th. Some residents counted seven distinct jolts before noon, each one a visceral reminder that the ground beneath their homes was far from stable. The pattern is unmistakable. This bears none of the characteristics of a main shock aftershock sequence. In a typical seismic sequence, a single large rupture dominates the narrative. Aftershocks follow in a predictable cascade, decreasing in both frequency and magnitude over days or weeks. The main shock releases the bulk of accumulated strain. This sequence defies that template. No clear main shock emerges from the data. The magnitudes remain remarkably similar across dozens of events. The tremors cluster tightly in space, yet spread out in time, arriving in unpredictable bursts separated by hours or days of relative quiet. They originate at similar depths, suggesting repeated activation of the same fault segment. The largest events sit within the same general magnitude range as scores of smaller tremors, rather than towering above them. Scientists classify this behavior as an earthquake swarm. Stress redistribution at depth, not the catastrophic rupture of a single locked segment, drives the activity. But what triggers stress to redistribute in this particular way, and why now, after years of relative stability? Earthquake swarms indicate something is changing beneath the surface, a shift in the delicate balance of forces that governs crustal behavior. Local stress is adjusting, either through minor fault-slip episodes or through changes in pore fluid pressure deep within the fractured rock. This behavior does not guarantee a major rupture will follow. Historical data from this region shows that past swarms typically dissipated without triggering larger events. But the activity cannot be dismissed. Swarms have erupted along this section of the Calaveras Fault before, most notably in 2015, 2003, and 2002, with similar episodes documented back through the 1970s. Each time clusters emerged, persisted for days or weeks, then gradually faded. 
In none of these previous sequences did a major earthquake follow, but the current swarm is lasting substantially longer than its predecessors. Past swarms rarely exceeded a few weeks before the fault zone quieted. This sequence has continued for nearly 10 weeks. Each time seismologists believe it may be winding down, another concentrated burst arrives, resetting the clock. The duration is highly unusual, and in earthquake science, duration changes the equation entirely. The activity concentrates on the northern segment of the Calaveras Fault, a major strike-slip structure forming the eastern branch of the San Andreas system. The fault extends roughly 190 kilometers from Hollister northward through the East Bay, eventually connecting with the Hayward Fault near Dublin and Danville. The Calaveras operates as a right lateral strike slip fault, meaning the Pacific Plate grinds northwest relative to the North American Plate. The motion mirrors the fundamental behavior of the San Andreas itself. Both faults accommodate the relentless horizontal shearing that defines the boundary between these two massive crustal plates. Over geologic time, this incremental movement manifests visibly. Roads develop subtle offsets, sidewalks crack and shift laterally, fences bend into peculiar zigzag patterns. The fault trace passes directly beneath densely populated communities. San Ramon sits nearly atop it, its suburban neighborhoods built across the active fault zone. Dublin, Danville, and Alamo spread along its length. More than 80,000 people call San Ramon home. Thousands more occupy the surrounding communities. All live within a few miles of the active fault zone. The San Ramon area occupies a transitional zone where the northern Calaveras Fault becomes structurally complex, fragmenting into multiple strands. The fault splinters into a maze of smaller, unnamed faults arranged in a fractured network between the main Calaveras Trace and Mount Diablo to the east. This structural complexity predisposes the area to swarm behavior. Fluids can migrate through the fractured crust more easily here than along simpler fault segments. As these fluids infiltrate fault surfaces, they reduce friction dramatically, triggering clusters of small earthquakes. The swarms light up the network in bursts of activity. Then, when fluid pressure stabilizes, the activity ceases. For years, sometimes decades, the area returns to silence. But the fundamental question persists. Why do these swarms occur at all? The answer lies partly in the phenomenon of aseismic creep. Some sections of the Calaveras Fault creep steadily at rates between 3 and 20 millimeters per year, releasing strain through continuous gradual slip rather than through sudden ruptures. Creep reduces seismic hazard by releasing accumulated strain incrementally, but it does not eliminate danger entirely. Where creep occurs at the surface, the uppermost crust slips continuously, but beneath this creeping layer, at depths where temperatures climb above 300 degrees Celsius, the fault may still be locked. At these depths, strain builds silently while the surface above creeps. Fluids play a critical but poorly understood role. Pressurized water exists throughout the crust, occupying pore spaces and fracture networks. When this fluid penetrates the fault zone, it can dramatically reduce the friction that normally locks fault surfaces together. When poor fluid pressure changes, the fault's mechanical behavior can shift abruptly. A sudden pulse of high-pressure fluid can trigger an earthquake swarm as friction drops across a network of interconnected fractures. But the relationship between surface creep and deep seismicity remains contentious among researchers. Some studies suggest swarms represent shallow features. Others argue that stress redistribution at depth drives both surface creep and swarm activity. The current swarm near San Ramon does not resolve these competing interpretations. It deepens the uncertainty. Mona Epstein lives less than a mile from the epicenter. On the morning of December 8th, two earthquakes woke her before dawn. She lay in bed listening to the house creak. Then, the magnitude 3.6 struck just after 9 a.m. The rumble came first, deep and low. Then, the violent shaking. The cupboard doors opened, my armoire door popped open and things popped out of the closet, Epstein said. 
she screamed. Afterward, she hesitated to shower. What if another quake hit while she was vulnerable? The fear became part of her routine. Nearly 1,600 people across the East Bay reported feeling that quake. For Epstein and her neighbors, the swarm has become a constant presence. The Calaveras Fault does not operate in isolation. It forms part of the San Andreas Fault System, an intricate network of interconnected faults that together accommodate the immense horizontal motion between the Pacific and North American plates. The Hayward Fault runs roughly parallel between them, creating a complex three-dimensional geometry beneath the Bay Area. Stress on one fault invariably affects the others. When one fault slips, it alters the stress field throughout the surrounding crust. This phenomenon, known as stress transfer, is not theoretical speculation. Scientists have documented numerous instances of seismic activity propagating between faults. Earthquakes on the San Andreas have triggered measurable creep on the Calaveras. Ruptures on branch faults have altered slip rates on the main system. The faults communicate through changes in the crustal stress field. The question confronting seismologists is not whether stress transfer occurs, but how efficiently it operates. Recent research from UC Berkeley reveals that the Hayward and Calaveras faults may be far more intimately connected than surface mapping suggests. Deep beneath the surface, the faults may merge into a single unified structure at depth. If this interpretation proves correct, the implications ripple through every earthquake probability calculation. A rupture initiating on one fault could theoretically propagate onto the other. The combined rupture length would be substantially longer than either fault could produce independently. And rupture length directly controls earthquake magnitude. The USGS calculated in 2015 that the Calaveras Fault alone carries a 7.4% probability of producing a magnitude 6.7 earthquake by 2045. But if the Hayward and Calaveras were to rupture together, the combined event could reach magnitude 7.3 or potentially larger. Magnitude 7.3 represents an earthquake capable of generating violent ground shaking across the entire East Bay. Damage would spread across densely populated urban corridors where millions live and work. The last time the Calaveras Fault produced a truly damaging earthquake was in 1984, when a magnitude 6.2 rupture struck near Morgan Hill. Before that, a magnitude 6.5 event in 1911 caused similar impacts. These historical ruptures remained confined to the Calaveras alone. A magnitude 7.3 event involving both the Hayward and Calaveras would be unprecedented in the modern era. It would affect millions of residents. Scientists disagree about what the current swarm means. Some argue it is normal for this area. David Schwartz, a geologist with the USGS, notes that similar swarms have occurred at least 10 times since the 1970s. None led to a larger earthquake. Other scientists are less certain. Roland Bergman of UC Berkeley points out that while past swarms lasted days or weeks, this one has continued for nearly two months. Sarah Minson of the USGS emphasizes that swarms indicate high stress levels. Small faults are reacting to stress in the region. That stress exists. Whether it will trigger something larger remains unknown. But one thing is clear. The swarms do not relieve stress on the main Calaveras fault. The small earthquakes occur on fractured, unnamed faults in the network. Stress continues to accumulate on the main fault. The San Andreas Fault looms behind all of this. The southern section has not produced a major earthquake since 1857, when a magnitude 7.9 rupture tore through the Carrizo Plain. More than 165 years have passed since that event. Stress has been accumulating relentlessly throughout that interval. The fault surface remains locked, frozen by friction, unable to slip. The longer the interval between major earthquakes, the more strain accumulates. Geological investigations suggest that major earthquakes have occurred at intervals averaging roughly 150 years over the past 1400. The fault has now exceeded that average interval. 
some seismologists use the term overdue. Stress accumulation rates measured using GPS networks range between 0.5 and 7 megapascals per century along different fault segments. The southern section has accumulated sufficient stress to generate a magnitude 7.8 earthquake or potentially larger. The northern section ruptured in 1906, producing the magnitude 7.9 San Francisco earthquake. That section has partially relieved its accumulated stress, though even there, smaller locked segments remain capable of magnitude 7 events. The San Andreas Fault System is fundamentally a network. Stress changes on one fault propagate through the crust, affecting the entire system. Could the Calaveras swarm trigger a larger rupture elsewhere in the system? Scientists cannot definitively rule out the possibility, but they emphasize that no clear mechanism has been identified. Swarms in this particular area have not preceded large earthquakes in the documented historical record. But the absence of precedent does not constitute proof of future safety. Past behavior provides guidance, not guarantees. The San Andreas Fault and its major branches have remained relatively quiet for decades. That prolonged quiet will not persist indefinitely. The stress continues building, millimeter by millimeter, year after year. And the swarm in San Ramon serves as a vivid reminder that the ground beneath California is never truly still. Scientists possess substantial knowledge about the Calaveras Fault's capabilities. They know it can generate earthquakes between magnitude 6.5 and 7.0. They know the current swarm reflects stress redistribution at shallow to intermediate depths. They know the swarm has persisted longer than most previous sequences. But critical gaps remain in their understanding. They cannot predict when the swarm will cease. They cannot determine with certainty whether a larger earthquake will follow. They cannot precisely map how stress transfers between the Calaveras, Hayward, and San Andreas faults at depths beyond direct observation. The Seismic Monitoring Network has developed concerning gaps. Several key stations experienced equipment failures during critical periods of swarm activity. Some data has been lost permanently. The uncertainty is not reassuring, but it represents the current state of earthquake science. Faults are extraordinarily complex structures. Stress accumulation proceeds gradually over decades. Triggering mechanisms often operate at scales below the resolution of monitoring networks. All seismologists can do is observe, measure, analyze, and refine their models, and wait for the next earthquake to test whether their understanding has improved. Over 150 seismic events have struck the San Ramon area since October, and the swarm shows no definitive signs of stopping. The stress remains elevated throughout the fractured fault network. The connection to the Hayward Fault creates pathways for stress transfer, and the San Andreas Fault remains locked, silent, and accumulating strain. What will finally break that ominous silence? And when the San Andreas ruptures, will the preceding signs resemble what is happening right now in San Ramon, or will it strike without warning from a section that appeared dormant until the moment it failed?